Welcome to the Play Create Podcast. I'm Kirsten Gunnerud. I'm Jill Johnson. And I am so excited today. We're going to jump right into it to introduce our guest, Robert Poynton. He's a, a, I consider a dear friend of mine. One of the first people I met when I started um, my career independently as a planner and has um, brought so much to me and my career and how I've approached things, and I'm so thankful for that, and we get to share him with you. This is the first time you're getting to meet Rob today, <laughs> and all of you. So, how are you, Rob? Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. I'm here in Oxford on a, a dark and, and kind of cloudy November evening, so it's very much winter drawing in here, but it's yeah. beautiful. And we're, we're, yeah, we're in Park City on a snowy morning. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So everybody has heard me and Jill talking in our last podcast. So Rob, what we've done is we've talked about, I call your EAO, everything's an offer, which yep. comes from your Do Improvise, yep. my favorite books. I call that in Rocket Trike World, the launch pad. And mm. so we've talked to people a little bit about in each of our sessions about letting go, noticing more, using everything. And then what that all adds up to when you start doing those things more and more in life or work or parenting or whatever it might be. I mean, just really everything, right? Yeah. Um, and so we've been exploring that and having a lot of fun exploring that. Mm -hmm. And it's been, become such a powerful tool for me in everything that I do. And clearly you wrote a book about it. It's been a powerful tool for you as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, what's interesting is um, I never stop learning from it. So I think that one of the things I'm often find myself saying in the workshop is that these ideas are, are kind of simple to understand, um, easy to learn, uh, and and so uh, it's the same is true for me. And so it's not that oh yeah i've got that down and i know how to do it the, the part of the value of the the set of ideas and of any kind of practice really is that you're never done and i think the simple practices are the best um so uh, if you, you know if you're a leader and you kind of go yeah listening yeah i did that really brilliantly in 2006 you're kind of like yeah but that's you need to keep doing it you know and so for me the the the, the joy in a way is that I constantly am working with it and iterating it. And the novelty comes from the context. So you've got this simple set of ideas, you get stuck or you're struggling or you can't find a way to unlock a situation. And then you can just rock back in your mind or in your chair and, and kind of go, okay, so hang on a minute. What am I not noticing? Yeah. What am I not noticing? What else could I notice? Am I looking in the right direction? Have I got the right kind of information? And of course the practice itself doesn't tell you anything about which way you should look. Um, for that matter, it doesn't tell you if you should be looking or listening or smelling or sensing or, or feeling, but it invites you to do something with your attention. And, and the creative act of that practice, and talking about noticing now, but it's true of the others, is that, you know, uh, if you look, you will find. And so if you put your attention on your attention and you notice what you are attending to, and therefore what you are not attending to, what you're ignoring, you will perforce get some new information or see something afresh or notice somebody else um, or notice something inside of you or look sideways and see a category or a business or a source of inspiration that you haven't noticed before. And so the, the act of noticing is kind of self-fulfilling in bringing you something new. And, and, and then the same would go for, for letting go or, or, or using everything. You know, if you kind of, one of the, the most, almost the most sort of dull version of this, if you start with use everything, you kind of go, okay, I want to use everything. And the first thing I often do is kind of go, so what have I got? Yeah. I've got a pen and a piece of paper and a desk with a coffee stain on it. And, you know, and you, and you can just start by kind of listing and, and looking at what you've got. And sometimes what you've got might not be, seem to be full of abundance. So you might kind of go, well, what I've got is, you know, uh, an angry colleague, not enough time, no budget and a broken whatever. And then, you, and then, but as soon as you go, okay, how can I use that? And you ask that question, then What's beautiful is you're not judging it anymore and going, oh, poor old me, or being angry with somebody else. So you're now your mind is engaged in kind of going, well, there's what I've got. And it's engaged in a constructive way and saying, how can I use that? 
Um, and so they all kind of flow into each other. They're, they're nicely framed as questions. You can never be done. Each context will bring you novelty. And one of the things, the, the most gratifying things, because it actually was another book, uh, which you won't find because it was just published by On Your Feet, but before Do Improvise, there was a book called Everything's an Offer. And you can still find that, by the way. You can, yeah, you probably find it very cheap. <laughs> I think. Um, and what was interesting about that was, because that was done in a much more direct and personal way, more people got hold of it that I know. You, I got a different kind of feedback from readers. And, and it was interesting to me how a clutch of people, not just one or two, but more than that, came to me and said that it had helped them through a very dark period. Um, so they were using it for a purpose, this set of practice, the launch pad, as you call it, for, for a, in a way that I had never anticipated, which in and of itself is kind of beautiful because that's true to the practice itself. I never thought this was going to help people through periods of depression or burnout or anxiety. And that was what I was hearing back from, you know, a number of people enough to make me feel that this wasn't coincidence. It wasn't just one individual. Um, and what they said was that it was this constructive rather than optimistic side to it. So there's a difference. So you think about optimism, pessimism, both of which I think are unhelpful positions. Either everything's great, so why bother? Or it's all crap, so why bother? Mm -hmm. um, and they're sort of, they're emotional tones, if you will. Um, uh, and, and constructive is different from that because it's saying, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And so no surprise then that the publisher that picks this up is a do book. And so, yes, you can do things with this. And so for somebody who's struggling and in particularly for depressed people, often they struggle to do anything. Uh, and the kind of pollyanna -ish, it'll all be fine. It'll all be great. You know, it's not as bad as you think. That just doesn't work when you're feeling bad. Whereas, you know, do this, try that, you know, look, look a different way. You know, th there's something just very practical about it. So that was a whole surprise to me, which which I thought was amazing. And um, I think when I first came across it, I thought, oh, I wonder what's next. And like 20 years later, you go, the same stuff. That's what's next. <laughs> it's always what's next. Um, and so you just take it and you use it again in a different way. And I think the other thing which has been really interesting to me to notice and get more articulate, I think, about explaining is how you know, when people write a book, there's always a, there's a, in a nonfiction book anyway, that everything is kind of a thesis. Um, yeah. But when you write a nonfiction book, you're kind of saying, you know, here's my idea or here's my thought. Um, there's a doctor actually, Thomas Lewis, who wrote a beautiful book called A General Theory of Love, which is about emotion. And in the introduction to that book, he says, um, a book is nothing if not an argument, a narrow, uh, sorry, an arrow uh, notched and fletched and flying to a target. And so, you, you kind of have to set your stall out to, to have some kind of, you know, I'm arguing for this. And so when you write a book about improv and let go, no small, use everything, everybody kind of thinks that you're saying everything should be improvised. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Uh, that's really not true. Um, I remember once coming into San Francisco, actually, on the United flight, and um, the captain saying, for those of you on the left of the cabin, if you look out the window, that's Yosemite. At least I sure hope it is, because if not, we're lost. Mm -hmm. You know, I just thought it was genius. Um, and after a long, boring flight from New York, and nobody thought we were lost. And, uh, but in general, I wouldn't want the captain to improvise. Um, <laughs> and, but not only that, the, the, there's a more important point here, which is that this set of practice does not replace or supplant or substitute for anything else. It adds to it. Mm -hmm. So all of this is also itself what, in improv terms, we would call a yes and. Um, and the military, my favorite example of this, um, because they have similar things in the academic world. These are called heuristics, simple rules of thumb that enable you to get by. And uh, in combat, I think it's the Marines have this thing about, you know, keep moving, stay in touch with your buddies and head for high ground. But the fact that they have those doesn't mean that they don't have all sorts of other things, you know, strategic plans and kind of real time information and drones and all the rest of it. But um, uh, and funny enough, actually, there was a, a U.S. Naval commander in, in the class on Monday, and we were talking about exactly this. But it sits as another layer over the top, so that in the fog of war, which is the phrase that the military use, um, which is interesting, the fog of war, people may not know this, but this came from Napoleonic times when there were many, many horses, cavalry, and all the stomping and thumping around of the men and the horses would literally throw up clouds of dust so that you could not see where anybody was. And that doesn't disappear just because we have high tech. 
Um, there's always uncertainty in combat situations. Um, and if you want to take that as a rather morbid analog for work, you know, we're all these days in complex uh, changing world. We're all in kind of combat, as it were, with things that we can't perceive clearly with information. Maybe these days are Problem is the opposite, so much information coming at us, we can't tell signal from noise, um, uh, and everything gets very confusing, but it's certainly unpredictable and complex. So in that world, to have some very simple rules that you know are always true, and that are always gonna prove useful, it just gives your mind somewhere to go. Something, ironically enough, in an uncertain world, it gives your mind something certain to land on. So, because you can be certain that asking yourself, you know, what else could I notice? How could I notice more? How can I let go of things I'm clinging on to, um, whether they be emotions or plans or identity or beliefs or assumptions, are always going to be fruitful in, in the terms of getting you going, getting you moving. Um, and so there's a kind of beautiful economy about it. Um, and so I was sorely disappointed because I never found anything else to follow it. I was like, oh, right, it's more of the same. Um, I think that's why it's been so powerful for me as well, is that it is so simple and it makes so much sense and it works so well in mm. so many different applications Yeah, that it, it has just become this natural, organic, foundational element. And yeah. Foundational is a really good word for it. Yeah. And I... Uh, I was teaching this class. I'm uh, a associate fellow at the business school here in Oxford, and uh, I was teaching a class earlier this week to a bunch of leaders. And uh, what I'm really proud of, I think, I've been working on that particular program for a very long time now. And my colleagues, who are you know intellectually you know pretty smart and familiar with vast bodies of theory, far more than I am, um, and I've seen lots of different brilliant speakers come and go around the area of complexity. Um, you know, I could name drop horribly now, but I won't. Um, and and yet, my my colleagues there, they say like you, Kirsten, that, that that they really this is sort of robust. It stood the test of you know hundreds, if not thousands, of people and proper smart academics. And and yeah, they'll say it's limited and there's all sorts of other things you need to know and be able to do, of course. But they kind of recognise its integrity and its value. Um, uh, as, a, as in this way I'm suggesting as a kind of additional additional layer um, and as a very very practical uh, kind of way of thinking about about life. We um, were just in Florida my family and spent mm -hmm. a day at NASA which I always love mm -hmm. doing and I always I mean even there I think about this because things like the Apollo 13 mission and what they had to overcome and they had they had to be precise and I did not know three uh, I'm going to get all 300,000 people were involved with building that space program. Every single part that they built had to be microscopically built and fit to work with building the rocket and the, you know, everything that went into space and everything that built those things and on and on and on. And yet, Every, what you'll hear from a lot of people who work there is that every day was filled with problems and unexpected and who knows yeah. what happened from here. And yeah. if they, I mean, I don't know that they consciously were thinking of these three things, but well, I know, there, I, no, I'm sure they weren't because that was a while ago now. Um, oh. <laughs> but, but, and, and it doesn't really matter which language you frame it in or couch it in. I think there's a certain elegance to this particular set of language. And somebody asked me recently, you know, where it came from. And, and I don't know, except that I do remember the precise moment it occurred to me, these particular words. I know it in a very boring street in suburban Madrid, just crossing the road. It just, it, I just, and that might be one of those false memories, but that's where it came that's where those words landed for me. So I don't know if I, you know, in NASA they were thinking about that specifically, but they were certainly embodying it and practicing it. And I, many years ago, I met Gene Krantz, the real Gene Krantz, not Ed Harris, who played the character in the movie, but the real Gene Krantz. And he was talking, and you know, he's made his living since then, I think, talking about that whole episode. And I'm not surprised because it's fascinating. And he was talking about the moment where they didn't know what happened. So they know. They know something's happened on the spacecraft, but they don't even know there's been an explosion at this point. They just know something's happened. And he talked about having to act in, in a realm of imperfect information. Precisely what he said was, sometimes you have to act before all the data is in, or you never get any more data in. And so in that realm of, of uncertainty and incompleteness, 
you can't rely upon a kind of analytical, rational, deductive way of reasoning because it, it, he said as much. He said, if we'd have done that, we'd have lost the spacecraft. So we had, it to, we had to sort of be willing to act into that uncertainty, which of course is what improvisers are very skilled at. And I've often used, as I'm sure many other people have, that famous scene from the movie where they make, you know, they say you've got to make uh, a scrubber, you know, they, they throw all the kit on the table that they have and they say you have to make one of these out of one of those. So literally make a square peg fit in a round hole and people's lives depending on it. Um, so, so yeah, they were embodying that. And the, the other thing, I have a friend of a friend, I never met this guy, he's dead now, but uh, it was a, a, a professor who worked with NASA during the building of the Saturn V rockets. And he commented about 10 years ago now, so a long time after the program was um, discontinued, those particular rockets. He said NASA couldn't build a Saturn V rocket anymore. They've got all the plans, they've got all the computer programs, they've got all the data, but they couldn't build it because those 300,000 people all knew things that weren't in the book. Yeah. And funnily enough, about three weeks ago, I was at Airbus, uh, the aircraft manufacturer in Hamburg, working with a leadership team there, not the leadership team of the whole of the, the, the company, but the cabin people. And, um, and they were talking about digitizing the cabin. And, and they had exactly the same problem. So it seems like in this transfer onto this new technology platform, that there are all sorts of things that the people that build the cabins of today's airliners know that you can't digitize that you just, they just don't fit in a computer because it's all about, oh no, but if it's a bit warm, you put that one on the upside down. You know, it's all that kind of stuff. The tacit and embodied knowledge. And so all of that kind of lies, you, you, it's, it, where we're going with all of this, I think, is to, is to say that the plans are never enough. Um, and we had this when we built our house. This is my favorite example for me personally, when we were building our house, uh, which is on a mountainside in rural Spain, so it's a pretty unusual kind of a, a house. And we had some fantastic craftsmen as builders. And I think that when I came into it, I assumed that um, this would all be about plans, right? Because, because it's a concrete, it's a structure, it mustn't fall down, it's on a hillside, there's all sorts of legal constraints, it costs a lot of money, all of those things that make you think this has got to be done right. And what I realized by, and it's interesting how I realized it, not by talking to the builders, but by being on site and watching and listening and and you know humping brick loading bricks and carrying stuff you know what i realized was how the planned part of the process and what you might call the creative adaptive part of the process were both necessary to each other so if you just had the plans you would have failed to build the house because the plans are incomplete in this case the architect was my brother-in-law so there'd be occasions where he'd show up on site and the builder would say oh i'm glad you're here can you see this right this bit doesn't work because that doesn't fit that, you see? See? Because on the two-dimensional computer screen, however good your CAD program, you know, there's always bits missing. Um, so on the one hand, there was sort of problem solving happening in the creative way. So it starts to rain, something you can't control. You can't work with stone when it's raining, so you do something else. And when you dig out the underside of the house, you realize that you could build a cellar with not much more effort that wasn't in the plans, right? So this kind of problem solving stuff happens. Um, but there's also kind of what I would call more positive creative adaptation. And again, it comes from being on site and noticing. So one day I was standing on the scaffolding looking up at the mountains, the Sierra de Gredos, which is literally out the window. And, and so I said to the builder, I said, um, oh, it'd be a shame when the scaffolding comes down, you won't be able to stand here and get this view. And so we got chatting and he said, well, let's build something. And so we built a piece of raised garden that wasn't in the plan. Um, and you wouldn't have got that if you hadn't been standing there making that comment and then willing, of course, to let go of the idea that, oh, no, it says in the plan this and, and willing to, you know, use some rocks that we had lying around that actually then saved us something because we didn't have to move them away. We just used them to build something else and on it goes, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not suggesting that again, back to the point about, do you improvise everything? No, uh, you'd need, but it's the, it's the dialogue between the planned and the structured and the adaptive and the creative that, that kind of, and you need both, you know. It's funny because when I was working um, in hospice, that was the biggest thing I learned for myself was I would have the plan of no plan. So yeah. I would show up at the door with this great idea. I had this plan. But then what I walked into was something totally different. Right. So if I stuck with my plan, I would miss everything around me. I wouldn't use everything. I wouldn't notice more. I wouldn't let go of what my preconceived notions were 
of what I thought something should look like in hospice or grief or death or whatever it might be in that moment. And so it's really something I've really concrete, concretized in my whole being was like, well, you can have a plan, but whatever you walk into, you know, you might have to let go of some of those aspects that you thought were really going to hold true. Yeah, that's right. I think there's a number of things about plans. So John Lennon, he said, you know, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. Yeah, that's right. And, um, but I think it's important to understand that the plans play two roles. So there are things we do uh, which require concrete, structured, organized, analytical thinking. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, but that's only part of the story. Uh, so we kind of need to be able to do that. Um, and we've got pretty good at doing that, actually. If you look at the complexity of our society and the scale and nature of the things that we can make from you know, aircraft to space rockets to cities to biotech, you name it, um, you need kind of a good, a good amount of that. And in a way, you could argue we've been so good at doing that and so successful that we've forgotten that that alone is not enough. And that even in, as we've been saying, in something which would appear to be purely technical, spacecraft building, house building, any other number of things you care to name, there's always another story, another side to it, another part of it that's necessary to make something work. But there's another uh, value to plans, which I think it's important to acknowledge, which is that plans are a way of relieving anxiety. Yeah. So we feel anxious when you stand on that doorstep, you know, you're, you're kind of, your, your attachment to a plan can be because it makes you feel better. And that's valid. You know, that calms some of our demons and allows us to stay in a frame of mind. But the important thing is to understand that the plan is a means, not the end. Yeah. And so, um, again, to quote another military guy, and, and I do often go to military examples because I think in some ways the military, because they deal with life and death, yeah. uh, Let's, well, let's say the military at war anyway. They, un they do understand this quite well. Um, and so, you know, the U.S. Defense Department have a doctrine for what's called sense and response. They don't have command and control anymore. Mm -hmm. They might do on the camps at, at, at peace, but when they're in combat again, you know, sense, sensing and responding to what's happening. Um, so, but the, the guy I was thinking of, he said, as a colonel at West Point, and he said, plans are proof that planning has been done. Mm -hmm. now if you're going to ask somebody to risk their lives or their career or their family or their reputation or whatever it is then the idea that somebody's thought carefully about it in a measured way before you start is helpful yeah. but if the point of the exercise then becomes to prove the plan right and this is of course what happens with targets mm -hmm. um so there's a law called good hearts law that says when an objective becomes a target it's neither a good objective nor a good target in other words, the system will kind of pervert itself in order to make the thing that's in the plan come true, even if that doesn't help. So a famous example here in the UK was when they set a target for the call-out time of ambulances, that the, the average call-out time had to be less than, I think it was eight minutes. Mm -hmm. But the, fact, the medical facts are that there's like 10% of cases where eight minutes is too late, you need to be there in two minutes. And 90% of cases where 10 minutes, 12 minutes, half an hour doesn't really make any difference, not to the health outcome. So you meet the target, you get the, all the ambulances there, and lots of people die as a result. So that's the kind of thing that we can get locked into when we focus on the plans as the end, not as a means. Mm -hmm. and, and understanding that part of the purpose and value of them is to make us feel better, and that that's okay, you know, because we need to feel better about things, because it's, you know, it's a pretty scary thing, this being a human being business, you know. I can't help but what's running through my brain right now is the Girl Scout, Scout motto to always be prepared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think I've, I've always, I'm a planner, like not just in the career that I had, but in, you know, I like to plan things, but I also, I don't know that I've ever thought about it as actually having a plan. I've always thought about it as being prepared. Yeah, and that's a nice distinction. Yeah. work with what I have and I know I'm going to have what or I think I'm going to have what I need to work with any situation. But for me, it's more about that, the prepared part. As yeah. And when, when Gary and I started on your feet, you know, there's always a learning curve at the beginning, right? And clients would say to us, all oh, right, you're improvisers. So we don't have to pay you for any prep then. <laughs> and we were like, Oh, and of course we did prep because we were, you know, wanting to do a professional job and everything. And of course, over time, what we realized is, of course, you prepare. 
Of yeah. course you prepare, but you prepare in a different way. Yeah. So you don't prepare a path, you prepare a territory. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a really lovely story that I only heard from Gary many years after I, I knew him, which was why he took up improv theater in the first place. So for those that don't know, Gary Hirsch is my business partner in, in the On Your Feet venture, which is how uh, this all kind of began for me. And uh, Gary had studied, uh, he was doing theater when he was at university, but he was really, really bad and really terrified at learning lines. He just found it really hard to learn lines. And as he said to me, he said, the thing about a script is it defines a single right path. Yeah. And of course, once you've got a single right path, and in rehearsal, of course, to the words, the right words, you add the right moves, which are blocked out and rehearsed and all the rest of it. Um, ironically enough, in order to look natural, supposedly, you know, um, but you have to rehearse them. And, and, and so you've got this one very narrow path of the right way of doing it. And you've effectively created an infinite number of ways to go wrong, because anything that's not that one way is now wrong. And he said, when I started improv, what I discovered is that there's no way to go wrong because you don't have a single prepared path. So all of a sudden you flipped it from being an infinite number of ways to go wrong into an infinite number of ways to go right or yeah. to go well, let's say. Um, and so in my work, preparation is always of a territory. And sometimes it drives colleagues nuts because not everybody I work with here in the business school anyway works this way. And so... Um, you know, they'll say things like, well, what are you going to do? And I go, I don't know yet. I mean, it could be this, could be that, could be the other. I've got some of this. I'll probably do that, but you know, we'll see. And, and, and it gets close to the time. And then they kind of go, you know, the night before they'll say, well, what are you going to do tomorrow morning? I don't, I don't know yet. Because what I'm waiting for is I'm waiting to see the first step on the path. And that might come from the person that introduces me or from the conversation I have in coffee the day before at the moment before, sorry, just, you know, they might be chatting to me and often I will use that. I will use what I've just heard. And, and, and I can do that because there's a vast territory of things that I can draw on. And, yeah. and that's what we're doing now. There's no plan for this interview. Um, uh, but there's a huge amount of preparation. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that, that's for me, part of the power again of the launch pad is that when you're doing those three things, it, you're kind of building your toolbox, your tool chest, or your, you know, whatever it is that you need. So you can go into those situations with more confidence because you've built your skills, you've practiced, you've worked in a way that allows you to work that way. Does that, I'm not articulating that. No, right. no, I think that makes sense. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot recently is about, um, in fact, I wrote a blog post the other day about, um, which is called Forget It, which is about how I don't remember anything. And, and people kind of laugh when I say that. And they say, well, you remember a huge amount. And I say, no, no, you just hear the stuff that I remember. You've got no idea how much I forget and how much is missing from all the things I've done and read and all the rest of it. So I've been thinking about this quite a lot. And I think for me, what it is, is, is that those, this way of working brings you alive and makes you notice. And as you say, using the, this launch pad in, in that way, what you'll do is it's a way of accessing those things in your experience, which are there, but which you can't find, yeah. which you don't know that you've learned. Mm -hmm. um, and it may look then that you, you know, and so you're, you're kind of making the most of everything you've got. And, and one thing sparks off another and one thing leads to another. Oh no, that reminds me. And whereas if you're trying to kind of, I don't know, it doesn't work. It's just the way my mind works. Maybe not, not everybody's like that, but I don't have some vast storehouse in my mind. I, I feel like I'm a chicken, you know, you know, how chickens when they peck around, they're kind of clucking oh, yeah. away <laughs> or running for their lives. They're like, oh, look at that, you know, and they're, and they're kind of suddenly their attention goes to something. Um, and that's how it feels, it feels to me. And so it's like way of bringing all of your experience and knowledge alive. And then between teams, um, you can do that too. Thank you for joining us today. As you can see, there's a lot to talk to Rob about. He is a vast encyclopedia, walking encyclopedia of knowledge and, and wisdom. And because of that, we have broken our time with Rob into three separate uh, parts of our podcast. In part two, we are going to continue on to the power of pausing, something Rob 
has been studying a lot and just wrote a book on, as well as the importance of play and, and the role, the important role that it plays in business and in life. And in part three, we really dive into the power of, of the pause, um, do a deep dive into it and really get into that special place that you can get to where you almost feel that you can shift time um, and take a pause even in the moment of action to find the opportunity that's there and work with it. We really hope you'll join us for parts two and three. At the end of part three is the invitation that we always extend of how you can work with and, and play with the things that we're talking about. So please enjoy and we'll hopefully see you in part two. Thank you.